Welcome back. A warning that our next interview contains talk about depression and suicide that may be triggering for some viewers. Well, during the pandemic, the number of Canadians struggling with mental health issues has been rising. Mark Hennick has dedicated his life to opening up conversations about these very issues. He's worked with the Canadian Mental Health Association and has been a mental health counsellor. And now he's sharing his personal story in his new book, So-Called Normal, a memoir of family, depression and resilience. Mark Hennick joins us now. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. So, Mark, your book describes your earliest days of depression, and you say being alone and feeling alone are kind of a chicken and the egg thing. It's hard to tell which is which. During the pandemic, I think, you know, it's no surprise that we've been apart more than ever. So how do you make sure that being alone doesn't equate to feeling alone? Well, something that I learned uh, from a very early time in my life was that our environment, our surroundings, are intrinsically linked with our mental health. I grew up in a small town in an isolated area out in the country, and I was feeling these feelings of depression and anxiety and isolation inside anyway. Uh, but I think it made it so much more difficult to reach out and actually tell people that because of my social circumstance and my environmental circumstance. That's very similar to what we see with people struggling right now. They very well might be dealing with either ongoing depression depression and anxiety that they'd already had, or something new that's come up because of the isolation and the change that, uh, that they've experienced over the last year. So I think it really reminds us to actively reach out to other people that we might be concerned about, even if they're not exhibiting any signs or symptoms of a, of a classic mental illness, just to check in because we're all in this tough time together. And I think that's where this question, next question leads quite naturally, because you actually write about the first time uh, being sent to hospital. It was suggested by your guidance counselor uh, in high school after he realized that you did have uh, some suicide ideation. And you write at the time that your mother was shocked. She perhaps didn't realize how bad it was. So to your point in continuing that thought you just shared with us, how much of this solution is perhaps checking in on someone that you may think or may not think is struggling? Yeah, when I was writing the book, I went back and pulled all of my medical records from that time in my life just to see how my struggles were uh, being interpreted by others around me. And that was one of the notes in that very first uh, hospital admission that the nurse quoted my mother saying that she didn't see it coming, which to me was such a surprise because I felt like I'd been struggling with it for so long that I couldn't deal with it any longer. Uh, but my mother didn't see it because I had learned as a person with a mental illness to be a very good actor, I think. I didn't want to inconvenience anybody or put anybody out. So I tried to hide it. I was scared of what people would think of me. Uh, that's still very much a problem that people deal with today, even though we've uh, uncovered a, or relieved a little bit of the stigma, we have so much further to go. Uh, so really, I think that act of reaching out non-judgmentally in particular shows people that they don't have to be afraid that people will think of them differently or treat them differently necessarily because they have a supportive network of people around them. And, and people need to know that. Uh, you write that uh, you were one of those people who could just not shake it off. And in fact, things got pretty dire for you. Uh, one day, and you write about this, you were standing on a bridge with suicidal thoughts. And you say uh, and recount the story of a man who was in a light brown jacket, who you say saved your life. Was that experience a turning point for you, Mark? It absolutely was. And look, I mean, I'm not Pollyannish about my recovery. Recovery is weird. It, it goes up and down and back and forth, and I've relapsed many times. Uh, and I didn't realize, in fact, that I had recovered until many years later when I had the opportunity to actually look back at this time when I had climbed up over the railing of that bridge. I felt like I, I was unfixable, unhelpable, that I was just a hopeless case. And if it wasn't for this stranger who stopped and talked to me and then ultimately physically reached out and grabbed me when I had let go of the railing, if it wasn't for him, I never really would have realized that there are people out there who can connect with you in a non-clinical way. You know, I, I didn't, he didn't ask me about my diagnosis or my medication or my symptoms. He asked me about my friends and my family and my life. And it's like he actually really got to know the real me. Uh, and I think that when I realized that that could be helpful, uh, that's what I tried to do with my life too. And uh, it wasn't until many years later, actually, with the help of CTV and Canada AM at the time, that I was able to reconnect with that stranger and finally thank him for saving my life. And we are going to get back to that incredible story in just a minute. But I do want to discuss uh, the question of medication, because you write about that. You write about the first time that it was offered to you and you didn't accept it. At the same time, it was your mom who said, no, my son doesn't need those mind-bending pills. 
where are we in the discussion about destigmatizing not only mental illness but destigmatizing medication for depression or anxiety? Are we getting further along or do we still have a really far way to go? I think we still do have a far way to go, but we have made good progress in people understanding depression medication in particular. Um, I think in some ways it's still a bit of an elementary understanding. So there's some people who feel uh, still uh, that you can just take a pill and get better. Uh, and that's rarely, both in my experience as a person with a mental illness and as a clinician, I've rarely ever seen that happen. It usually takes so much more, uh, in particular around social supports and psychological supports. But that said, um, I I eventually did find a medication that helped me very much. I couldn't I couldn't go to therapy if I couldn't get out of bed in the morning because of the symptoms of my depression. So for me, it was really a combination approach that ultimately worked. And now I'm at a point where uh, I don't need either every day, uh, but I also have no shame, no hesitation whatsoever in going back and re-engaging those supports if I need them. So I think we have come a long way in, in destigmatizing that piece of treatment. Okay, let's get back to that story of that man who you say saved your life. You said you were able to reconnect with him. What was that like? I don't think you can fully appreciate that kind of um, closing of a circle until you you feel like you don't own your own story. And that's how I felt. I felt like other people had told my story uh, for so long, even though I'd been speaking openly since high school after that man saved my life. Uh, and after I had done my TEDx talk and that went viral around the world, I still didn't even know who he was. And that was a secret that I had held inside me because I didn't I didn't believe myself. I didn't know if he was even real. Um, so I decided I needed to find out. It was uh, Bell Let's Talk Day. I wanted to do it the day after Bell Let's Talk because I'm a big fan of talking every day. Uh, and I asked Canada M if they would have me on to ask for the public's help in finding this stranger because I had no other way to find him. And, and I had been doing some uh, speaking about mental health in media for a few years, and they invited me on. I shared the story. I went on social media, my Twitter and Facebook pages, and asked for the public to help me find him. And sure enough, within about an hour, uh, we located him. Somebody said that uh, he, he was his brother-in-law at the time, and he had seen, the stranger had seen my TED Talk just a week earlier, and he had written me a letter in case someday he ever found me. So it's like there was something in the universe that just needed to bring this this story to its uh, uh, to its conclusion. And we got to meet on camera for Canada AM, and I finally got to thank him, not just for saving my life, but really for giving me my whole life ever since. You write in your book about resilience, and um, you say that resilience is a, a muscle. How can anybody watching right now really learn to strengthen that muscle? Well, you, you can't avoid difficult times. You can't avoid your difficult emotions. Um, we spend so much time, so much energy and effort running from our triggers and uh, uh, avoiding everything that makes us uncomfortable. But resilience doesn't develop when you're only having good days, when, when it's positive vibes only. Resilience is how you get back up, not how you stay up. So when you fall and fall and fall, eventually you learn how to fall better and to get up faster. And really, I think of that as the gift of my depression now, and even the gift of my relapses, has been to remind me, I've been through this before. I've survived 100% of my worst days, as is said. Uh, so I think that's what you need to keep in mind, uh, that resilience, uh, becoming stronger, it can really only be done by walking through fire. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. The book is called So-Called Normal. It is available now. And if you're struggling, we have a list of resources available on our social media. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.